is uh, electron phonon coupling and harmonicities and special displacement uh, uh, from uh, uh, Zacharias. And today is uh, special. The, 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 the conference will be a bit longer. We will have the poster session. And we have already uh, placed some information, but we will put more information on the website shortly. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, Fritz the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Samuel. So can you see me, hear me, and see my pointer on the slides? Yeah, all good. OK, thank you. Um, OK, uh, good day, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Feliciano Giustino from uh, uh, UT Austin again. And um, uh, in this lecture, we're going to discuss a little bit, uh, uh, you know, how to uh, discuss polarons uh, in, uh, you know, in the context of initial calculations. Uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar, at least with the intuitive notion of polarons. So what we'll do here is to try to to uh, discuss this in a little bit more detail and discuss uh, some uh, techniques that we could use to uh, uh, study these uh, objects. So this is the outline of the uh, this lecture. Uh, it seems long, but actually every component is uh, pretty short. First, I will uh, 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 remind ourselves of what we mean by polaron, then uh, uh, summarize some recent uh, uh, angle resolved photoelectron spectra uh, where uh, several groups uh, have discussed the observation of, of, of polarons. Uh, and then uh, uh, I will go on to uh, uh, review how people might do calculations of these uh, objects using DFT, and then uh, uh, some more recent work uh, uh, starting from simple models and then uh, generalizing them to uh, ab initio approaches. At the very end, I will try to connect uh, what, uh, uh, so this lecture with um, uh, what I discussed on Monday, uh, trying to you know convince you that we now um, are approaching a, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a type of theory uh, of polarons that uh, uh, connects to the many body theory of electron phonon interactions. So first of all, uh, uh, the intuitive notion of polarons. So these figures are taken from uh, a review article uh, by the group of uh, Cesare Franchini in uh, Vienna. So these are very nice uh, uh, comprehensive uh, article on polarons summarizing both uh, theory and um, experiments. So I would uh, highly recommend it. So the, the figure on the left shows basically uh, an you know, idealized uh, situation where you imagine having an electron in a crystal, and then these electrons may might interact with the atoms uh, uh, in such a way as to uh, push away uh, negative uh, uh, ions and then attract uh, uh, positive uh, uh, ions. And if the interaction is strong enough, uh, this object might become uh, localized. Okay, And that's what we uh, think of as being a, a polaron. So one of maybe the most important manifestation of these objects is that uh, uh, they might experience a barrier when you try to move from one lattice site to another site. So this is illustrated by this uh, figure on the right, where uh, you have a, uh, let's say this uh, a localized electron sitting on one lattice site. And then if this electron needs to go to the right, it will have to go uh, through a more delocalized kind of uh, configuration until it sits on the right side. And in this process, uh, it will encounter a uh, potential energy barrier. So to go from the left to the right, uh, we say that this uh, uh, localized object um, uh, uh, basically jumps from one side to the other via hopping process. And this process uh, is uh, thermally activated, meaning that uh, if you increase the temperature, there is more likelihood of, of, of uh, this happening. So this has implications in uh, current transport. I'm gonna show that in two, with two examples. So on, uh, in these slides, we discuss uh, uh, titanium dioxide, which is a standard uh, transparent conductor. You use it a little bit everywhere in, in, uh, from um, you know, uh, uh, solar cells to photocatalysis. Uh, the left side of the, the slide is about the anatase um, uh, polymorph, and the right side is about the rutile polymorph. Uh, so they are basically the same structure, titanium dioxide, uh, but uh, they are arranged in slightly different ways. So the plots here show the resistivity, uh, the electrical resistivity as a function of temperature. So in the case of anatase, you see that the resistivity increases with temperature. And in fact, this uh, trend uh, follows exactly uh, the uh, prediction that you would uh, have from the Boltzmann transport equation that was discussed uh, on um, uh, Monday. Now, if you look in, instead on the right, uh, uh, on the right panel, uh, what you see is that the resistivity actually decreases with temperature. So this kind of behavior is something that you cannot obtain from the Boltzmann transport equation, okay? So the other interesting observation is that the scale here is uh, 10 to the minus four ohm per centimeter. 
and here it goes up to about 10 ohm per centimeter. So that means that uh, the, the resistivity on the right panel is about 100 times higher than the one on the left panel, okay? So uh, uh, what when experimentalists see these kind of uh, uh, pictures, uh, uh, what they uh, conclude is that on this side, we have a type of transport that does not fall within the standard Boltzmann formalism, and that is more of the type of activated, like uh, thermally activated transport, uh, like the one I, I discussed uh, in the schematic in the previous slide. And this is taken as a signature of the presence of uh, small polarons in a uh, material. A similar uh, kind of experiment uh, uh, here is shown for um, another system that is very famous uh, in the uh, in the literature. This is a, 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 a lanthanum manganate. Uh, is essentially the the prototype of colossal magnetoresistive uh, uh, peroxides. Uh, this has been studied uh, a lot in the 90s. And uh, what happens in this compound is that if you have only lanthanum, so x equals zero, uh, this is a essentially an insulator. And uh, lanthanum has three electrons. So if you substitute uh, by strontium, which has two electrons, you are basically doping the system with holes. And by doing that, uh, you bring the system into a more metallic phase. So uh, what uh, you see in this picture is again the resistivity. So if I look at the bottom, that corresponds to x equal 0.4. That's essentially a metallic phase. And as in the case of anatase, titanium dioxide, the resistivity increases with temperature. So you can hope to capture this behavior by using, for example, the Boltzmann transport equation implemented in EPW. On the other hand, if you go for a small x, for example, this is nominally x equals zero. I mean, x very small, let's say. You see that the resistivity now decreases with temperature, and it's much higher than what you find in the metallic uh, kind of um, case. So this is uh, what people take as a signature of, uh, you know, the formation of small polarons in these um, kind of uh, uh, materials. And that's the kind of things that one would like to study uh, using ab initio methods. So what I would like to discuss in the next maybe uh, three or four slides is a set of uh, uh, experiments which were carried out uh, during the past 10 years, uh, where uh, several groups have discussed the existence and, and properties of uh, polarons in um, uh, some materials uh, by means of uh, angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy, so ARPES. So uh, what basically I will tell you is that there is ways of trying to look into polarum physics via ARPES, but this kind of technique does not uh, provide us uh, with information about localization or hopping transport or things like that. So uh, there is a little bit of caution one should use in interpreting these experiments. So first of all, what is an ARPES measurement? Uh, conceptually, uh, this consists of um, a shining light into a sample. And then if the uh, uh, energy of the photon is uh, larger than the uh, work function of the, your sample, you might be able to extract electrons. If that happens, the electrons are collected into an analyzer. And then uh, using the, the information about exit angle and the kinetic energy at the exit, one reconstructs the band structure of uh, you know, the, 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 the sample. Okay? So that's a very uh, direct way to measure uh, many body band structures in, 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 uh, in materials. So this is a measurement of the uh, uh, conduction band bottom of anatase titanium dioxide, okay? So what you're looking at, for example, on the left panel is uh, uh, the conduction band bottom. So this little uh, blue blip here. So this corresponds to a situation where uh, this insulator has been doped by creating oxygen vacancies, okay? Which in, uh, uh, inject electrons into the conduction. Since there's a very low density of electrons, uh, you see only a little bit uh, of, uh, of the conduction band here. Now, the surprising uh, observation in this experiment was that on top of this conduction band, there was also a little bit of a, uh, uh, something looking like a defect state below the conduction band. So this belongs to the band gap. And this was interpreted as the formation of a polar. And then in this study, you know, this is from the uh, group of Grioni in Lausanne, uh, they also looked at how this changes with uh, doping uh, density and so on. But the important thing is that there was an observation of a feature inside the gap that was interpreted as a polar. So this is a similar experiment. And I'm just putting it in here because uh, uh, there is a broadband um, uh, measurements of the entire uh, uh, you know, band structure. This is a europium oxide. Europium oxide uh, at low temperature crystallizes in a rock salt structure, so like uh, you know, sodium chloride, for example. And there's a very neat mass structure which consists of uh, europium 4F electrons in the valence and oxygen 2P states. And if you do uh, for the electron spectroscopy, you find 
the four F bands here and the two P bands here, so very cleanly. Then if you add gadolinium uh, replacing europium, since gadolinium has three electrons uh, and europium has two electrons, what you do is to dope a few electrons into conduction band. Then when you zoom into the conduction band bottom here, you find this kind of picture. So again, we have a, a blip here, which would be the, the doped conduction band bottom of this material. And then there is another uh, signature here and another one below here. And again, these have been interpreted as signatures of polarons in, um, in these uh, materials. Now, uh, let me try to rationalize a little bit uh, what has been observed. Uh, before doing that, I just want to also say that uh, the, this also is observed in uh, 2D materials. For example, this is uh, 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 hexagonal boron nitride, uh, and this is a uh, basically observation again of uh, valence band top, satellite, and another satellite. And this was interpreted again as a uh, um, as a uh, formation of a localized polaron in a boron nitride. So all these pictures basically have this kind of um, uh, a structure. One is looking at um, uh, uh, a few tens or hundreds of millivolt of conduction band. Imagine you do a difficult calculation, you get this uh, kind of structure. Then uh, you add the electron photon interaction, and this will be slightly normalized uh, because we talked about mass normalization on Monday. And then on top of that, these experiments also see some features looking like this. Okay, so these features may be a little bit broad, maybe not looking exactly like parabolas, but there are features there. But one important thing that one observes in all these experiments that I mentioned is that these features are separated from the conduction band bottom precisely by the energy of a phonon. Okay, so now what this means is that uh, uh, these are not deep uh, defect states that you find inside the band gap, but they're really small satellites that uh, are separated from the band by a simple phonon energy or twice the phonon energy, okay? So this basically raises some suspicion that maybe these are not exactly the localized objects that we call polarons. Now, uh, uh, to, to try to understand what these features are, let me go back to uh, a figure that I showed you on Monday. So if you remember on Monday, uh, I, I use a model to describe the effect of the fan middle self energy on the electron band structure of a metal, for example. So this uh, uh, yellow line is supposed to be a portion of a uh, you know, large parabola. And uh, uh, the Fermi level is so large that uh, the phonon energy is much smaller than the Fermi energy. So this parabola uh, uh, basically looks like a, a straight line here in yellow. And we say that when you uh, consider electron phonon interactions, there is a change of, uh, uh, of uh, slope here. And there is this kind of uh, kinky structure on this, uh, uh, you know, in this band structure. So that's actually what happens uh, uh, just as a result of the fan middle self energy. And this example refers to a case where the phone energy is much smaller than the, than the Fermi level. Well, I could also use the fan middle self energy for a scenario where the Fermi level is comparable uh, in magnitude to the phone energy. If I do that, I find this uh, kind of picture. So in this picture, what you need to imagine is that the, uh, instead of having a yellow line here that has a Fermi level very far down, now the Fermi level is just this uh, height here from the bottom of the parabola to, to the you know, to top of the figure. And as a result of the electron phone interaction, the yellow band here uh, uh, changes slopes. So the slopes uh, becomes milder here. On the other side, also the slope changes. And the, the change of slope is such that the two sides of the parabola actually merge in the middle. So instead of having a uh, just a, a kink here, what is happening is that the, the, the boundary connects and then there is a, uh, basically a, a little bit of a leak of a spectral weight down here, okay? Uh, so this part here is basically the friend of this broad feature on the, on the left-hand side. So this is to say that um, if you have a situation where your phonon energy is comparable to the Fermi energy, already using the Fermi self energy, you have a formation of a, uh, band with a heavier mass and the formation of a sort of uh, feature here, which actually is not a new state, but is an incoherent satellite coming from this electron phone interaction. And the important point is that in this calculation or in this model, there is no notion of electron localization. So this is done with the family that self energy described on Monday, which, where, which is periodic in the, you know, kind of across the unit cells. And just to convince you, this is not just about a model, uh, uh, I'm reproposing here the experiments on europium oxide on the left. So this was the spectral function I showed you earlier. And the figure at the bottom is the same, but uh, cutting through uh, here, through the band bottom. 
So you see a, a big peak and there are satellite and a satellite. So that's what we would call the quasi-particle peak. And these are the satellites. Uh, uh, this is similar to what I showed you when I was talking about spectral function on Monday. If you do a calculation of these properties uh, using the middle self energy, uh, what you obtain is a, a feature looking like this. And then if you do a cut in the middle, again, you find a quasi-particle peak, a satellite and satellite and so on. I should say that actually that this is not exactly only the FAMIDA self-energy. One needs to do a little bit of an improvement over that, which is called the cumulant expansion. We don't need to go into the, these details, but the bottom line is that uh, these calculations do not involve any electron localization, okay? So when in the experiments we see this kind of features, uh, we are tempted to assign them to electron localization or whole localization, but those features can be reproduced fully without ever invoking localization. So maybe these things that are often called polarons or polaron satellites in the ARPES literature are not exactly what we have in mind when we talk about polarons. So what are these features? So the best way that I have to uh, you know, kind of imagine it but for myself is that in photoelectron spectroscopy, you shine light into a sample and that re results into the extraction of an electron, right? Once you do that, you create a hole in the system and this hole by nature is a charged object. Therefore, it will interact with the positive ions and the negative ions in your lattice, and it will trigger a, a vibration on your lattice. So in this uh, kind of schematic representation, what is happening is that as soon as you pull out an electron, uh, this creates uh, essentially a ripple in, in your system, and this ripple is precisely what uh, uh, gives rise to these satellites that we are discussing. So this object is not uh, what we think of uh, when we uh, uh, kind of discuss polarons, in the sense that polarons are really ground state objects, okay? While this thing is really the result of an excitation. And all this discussion about ARPES was just to make sure that we understand uh, what we mean when we talk about uh, polarons. So to be precise, whenever we see papers on um, uh, these ARPES features or signatures of polarons, maybe we should really call them phonon sidebands or phonon satellites as opposed to polarons. Now, then how do we study the polaron uh, you know, as a concept, like a localized object? Well, I think uh, uh, to do that, uh, we can uh, go back just to density functional theory and uh, think in very simple terms as if we had a, a supercell and try to see what would happen if we did a calculation and try to look for uh, electron localization. So in this uh, diagram, you see basically a, uh, an insulator and a schematic of an insulator. We have valence bands completely filled. The conduction band is empty. So the dots here would represent the atomic positions and uh, this uh, black line is the, let's say the, uh, we can call it the constant potential in the FT, which is also periodic. Now uh, to think about polarons, what I do is to uh, uh, ask what happens if I add one extra electron to the system. Now, if I add an extra electron, and I look for the ground state, well, the ground state will correspond to the electron sitting in the conduction band bottom, right? But if I'm sitting in the conduction band bottom, that means that my electron is a block electron, and therefore uh, it has to be has to have a charge density that is periodic. Uh, so this would be, for example, the charge density of the electron uh, shown here in the bottom of the band. So in this case, we say that the electron is fully delocalized. And that's what you find if you do a supercell calculation, I don't know, of a of titanium dioxide and you add a, a, an electron, uh, you don't move anything, uh, uh, you will find a, a delocalized state. Now let's make a kind of a, a kind of a computational experiment where you, we move some atoms near the center of the cell. If you do that, the potential will change. It will create essentially a little bit of an accumulation of, of um, uh, you know, negative uh, uh, potential in the center. And at this point, two things can happen. If this potential is very shallow, uh, it will act as a scattering center, like a shallow impurity in a semiconductor, and uh, the electron will remain localized. However, if this potential is deep enough to admit bound uh, solutions of the Schrodinger's equation, what it could happen is that we have a uh, localized electron as a solution, and since it is no longer periodic, it cannot belong to the block band, but it must sit inside the band gap, okay? So this object is what we usually uh, think of uh, when we talk about polarons. It's something like a, a, a defect in the system uh, that is intrinsic and it has not to do with the you know, uh, impurity atoms, but it has to do with the electron phonon interactions. Now, the question is, can we do this by direct, direct DFT calculations? 
Well, that is basically what uh, has been done for many years. And this is an example from, from this paper. It's basically uh, a, uh, just a prototypical uh, oxide that is find, found in battery materials. It's basically lithium peroxide. It's a layer system of lithium and oxygen. And if you add uh, uh, an electron to this insulator and look for the ground state, uh, and then you plot the electron density of the conduction band bottom, you find these yellow uh, isosurfaces. So this is to say that the electron density is fully uh, uh, delocalized. And that's the solution you find. Now, what you could try to do is to repeat the same uh, kind of uh, experiment I showed you in the previous slide is by moving, for example, some atoms here close to each other. Then you relax uh, again the structure to find the electronic ground state. And then you, you, you let the atoms go. So you let also the atoms uh, find positions with uh, zero force. If you do that, you find this uh, uh, new state that is now localized, some kind of atomic distortions that are surrounding it. And uh, the interesting observation is that the total energy of this object is lower than the total energy of this object. That means that this is the localized, stable, uh, uh, polaronic ground state, OK? And at, at this point, I could just say, well, this is how one could do polarons, and the lecture could stop here. However, if we are giving a lecture about this, is because there are some challenges with this uh, approach. Basically, there are two uh, uh, important challenges. The first one is that if you repeat this calculation using a different exchange and correlation function, you will likely find a different result. Sometimes you find no localization. Sometimes you find something that is much more localized, and sometimes the energetics of these uh, different uh, uh, calculations uh, uh, can give very different numbers. So predictive power uh, 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 is lacking. And the second problem is that uh, uh, in this approach, you can only study very small polarons. And the reason is that uh, if, uh, for example, your polaron uh, is of the same size as the supercell that you're using, well, maybe this object will not localize. So if you try this uh, kind of exercise in a system like this, you do not find a localized solution. It doesn't mean that there is no polar. It just means that your supercell may not be large enough. So what you have to do at that point is to increase the supercell. But if you really want to establish the size of the polar in, in a system, well, you need to go as high as you can until you find some kind of local solution. And sometimes you end up with systems with thousands and thousands of atoms. And that's very difficult to calculate, of course. So uh, at this point, uh, I want to, to explain the, the issue about the sensitivity of uh, the energies uh, and the localization to the uh, exchange and correlation functional. And I want to do that using a uh, very nice work by the group of uh, Matthias Schaeffer, where they looked at uh, uh, the sensitivity and they proposed uh, approaches to um, kind of uh, mitigate this, this effect. So this was a study uh, that I think was performed for a, a whole polaron, so an electron removed from magnesium oxide. And they also consider it uh, titanium dioxide. So this figure is for magnesium oxide. Uh, so what this figure is basically is the, the formation energy of the polaron, meaning how much more stable the polaron is with respect to the delocalized solution, and plotting this energy versus the uh, fraction of exact exchange in an HSC calculation, all right? So you know that in HSC, if alpha is equal zero, you go to BB, otherwise alpha equal one, you go to full um, Hartree fog. So what you see in this figure is that if I use BB, uh, uh, the localized polaron state is unstable, meaning that the ground state is fully delocalized. As you increase the fraction exact exchange, the polaron becomes progressively more stable until it reaches a critical value of this exchange fraction where the polaron turns into a stable object and is more stable than the periodic delocalized solution. Okay. Problem is, is that as you keep going, uh, you know, your uh, energy changes from, in this case, from zero to two and a half electron volts. So if you were to pick an exchange fraction in this range, you could have a polaron energy swinging by, you know, a, a very large uh, amount. So clearly, this is problematic. And in this work, essentially, they propose an approach uh, based on the Koopman's uh, theorem uh, that uh, uh, mitigates these effects and makes these calculations uh, less sensitive to the uh, uh, ex exchange fraction. I also want to mention that there is also more recent work by the group of uh, Alfredo Pasquarello here, it was published last year, where they also uh, proposed uh, uh, new approaches to perform calculations of polarons using hybrid functions that um, you know, mitigates this uh, issue of sensitivity to the fraction of exact exchange. 
So what I, I would like to do now is to try to uh, explain why this is happening. And uh, uh, the bottom line is that this has to do with the uh, uh, self-interaction problem in density functional theory. So to do that, uh, uh, let me use an extremely simple model uh, because this model actually um, uh, is not useful for predictive calculations, but it contains a lot of physics and it makes us really uh, understand very clearly what happens when you find uh, 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 electron localization. So this is a model by Landau and Pecker. Actually, uh, it was invented by Pecker first, and then there were some papers together with Landau on the effective mass and things like that. So now it's called the landau pecker model. Uh, it's a very simple model that consists of the following uh, two parts. So we consider one electron that is added to a material. Now, uh, since uh, these authors did not want to consider the complexities of uh, atomic positions and all that, uh, because you know this is from the 1940s, uh, what they did is to consider a simple continuum uh, uh, model. Basically, you imagine a, a, a cube. This cube is a, a continuum dielectric that is characterized by just two numbers, the electronic dielectric constant and the static dielectric constant, including the ionic contribution. So you can have this electron, and then you can study the energetics of this object, and you can ask whether the electron will localize or not. So they propose the following energy or Hamiltonian for the system. It consists of two parts. One part is the kinetic energy of the electron here. Okay, it's a quantum mechanical part. And the second part is the electrostatic energy of the uh, uh, of this uh, medium uh, and that will be polarized by the presence of the electron. Okay, so this is just the, the same expression for the energy density of the electrostatic field that you find in uh, you know uh, you know introductions to electricity and magnetism. Now, the question is, what do I do with this energy? Because I have both uh, wave functions and electric and, and displacement fields. So their idea was very simple. I can uh, relate the displacement field to the electron density, which is just the wave function modulo square of one electron via the Gauss law. And then I can relate the displacement to the electric field via the dielectric constant. With this relation and this relation, I can rewrite this integral in a very simple way that contains only the electron wave function here and here. And if you look carefully, this looks basically like a Hartree type integral. Now in this expression, I have the dielectric constant of the ions here that comes from here. However, um, we need to take into account the fact that the electronic screening is already taken into account because I'm using an effective mass uh, for the um, electrons. So we need to remove the electronic dielectric screening from this expression in order to avoid double counting of this uh, uh, effective mass. So with this expression, we have a kinetic energy that depends only on the wave function and an interaction energy that depends only on the wave function again. So this energy is really a functional of the wave function. And what I can do when I have a functional is to try to find the minimum energy by performing a functional derivative. And this leads, as usual, like for the Kohn-Sham equations, it leads to a standard Schrodinger type equation for the wave function where the eigenvalue here comes from the Lagrange multiplier that relates to the normalization. So this is basically kinetic energy and interaction energy of the electron with the lattice via the dielectric screening. And then we have uh, you know, the standard uh, eigenvalue on the right. So this is what is called the landau pecker equation. The reason why I'm putting this equation here is that it is very easy to analyze. So how do people analyze this equation? Uh, the idea is very simple. I uh, try to solve the problem variationally, meaning that I choose a shape for the wave function. For example, I take a hydrogen wave function, and then I look for the minimum energy by changing the size of this function. So in particular, I can say my wave function is equal to the uh, 1s hydrogen wave function, except that I change, I, I keep the size of this wave function as a free parameter. Here, I would also have to add some normalization, and then I replace the wave function in the previous equation, and that will give me an energy that will depend only on the radius. So the energy will contain two parts, the kinetic part that looks like that. So this is the same expression you find for the you know, square well potential in uh, you know, uh, elementary introductions to quantum mechanics. So this energy depends on the radius as is shown by the blue line. So this means that to minimize this part of the energy, uh, you want to have a polaron that is as large as possible. Okay, So in the limit, uh, uh, it has to be de fully delocalized. And the second part, which has to do with the interaction with the lattice, is this uh, uh, Coulomb-like term that has a minus sign and is shown by this red line. So in this case, to minimize the energy, you want to have the polar as localized as possible. So ideally, you want the Dirac delta function uh, uh, of uh, you know, infinitesimal size. 
So clearly there is a competition between delocalization and localization. And if you take the sum of these expressions, you find a minimum, okay, in, in this curve that corresponds to a stable localized state that has energy that is lower than the fully delocalized solution, okay? So this is the mechanism whereby you have uh, electron localization in a, um, a continuum dielectric. And this actually is uh, uh, very representative of many real systems, actually. So that's why this model is useful. So why I'm, I'm bothering you with this model? Uh, uh, the reason is that uh, with this model, uh, there is a very easy way to understand the problem of self-interaction in DFT. And I'm gonna show you in this slide. So this is the potential energy landscape that we just obtained. And this was obtained using this uh, uh, potential uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, energy in the landau pekar equation. So we need to take into account that the landau pekar equation was invented before DFT was introduced, okay? So landau pekar equation from the 1940s, DFT is, uh, you know, mid the 1960s. So they did not know at this point of the self-interaction problem. Suppose now that we repeat the same model uh, in a DFT context. So in DFT, we would have a term that has to do with self-interaction. Why? Because the electron wave function generates a hard three potential that uh, uh, feeds back on the wave function itself. So if I were to do this in a DFT calculation, I would have also a, a term like that for hard three. And there would also be a, an exchange and correlation part that I'm not including because it just adds an extra complication without uh, giving us much more information. So this DFT self-interaction term corresponds to the red line here. Now, if I add the black part and the red part, what I obtain is this uh, blue line, which means that as soon as I switch on, uh, you know, I, I transform this model into a DFT type model, well, I lose localization completely, okay? Now, that means that DFT in principle should not be able to localize this kind of tolerance. So what happens then uh, uh, with the hybrid functionals? Well, you know that the Fock exchange in hybrid functionals, what it does, uh, among other things, is to compensate for the hard three self interaction. Okay. So that means that if I perform hybrid functional calculations, I have these two situations as extremes. First, if I set alpha equal one, I cancel this term exactly, and therefore I obtain the black line. Second, if I set alpha equal zero, this red line remains, and I go onto, onto the blue line. So that means that if I change alpha from zero to one, I generate a set of curves that go from the blue line to the black line here. And that means that by changing alpha, I can tune the polar energy landscape uh, essentially as I want, okay? And this is uh, uh, the reason why you have a significant dependence of the energy uh, uh, onto the, uh, on the uh, uh, fraction exact exchange. So clearly this is a, a, a fix that one can use, but it's not satisfactory because we don't want to do calculations that uh, depend on parameters. So what uh, uh, some of us have been doing the past few years is to think, rethink, this, re rethink this problem uh, uh, in terms of uh, a formalism that does not have self-interaction at all. So uh, what we did basically uh, here is to restart from density functional theory. So this is just the DFT equations. And we try to think of how to to, um, to eliminate self-interaction and how to do calculation of tolerance uh, more efficiently. So this is a, a kinetic energy in DFT, hard three energy with the N being electron density, exchange correlation energy, the uh, 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 interaction between the electrons and the uh, uh, ionic lattice. So this will be the ionic potential, or if you want, this will be represented by the pseudo potential, and then the ion-ion interaction term. Now, if you add uh, one extra electron to the problem, what is going to happen is that the density will be modified by adding, you know, suppose uh, you have a field valence band and you add an electron to the conduction band, so you will add this part. Then what could happen is that if you have a localization, the atomic uh, position will change uh, into something which is the original position plus a small displacement, let's call it uh, U uh, sub kappa. And at this point, I can try to rewrite this expression with these two kind of modified density and positions. If I do that, I find the Kinetic energy will have my original wave functions plus a new wave function uh, uh, that adds an, an extra contribution to the energy. Then the hard three energy will have the original density plus an extra density coming here. And the, again, density original plus the extra term. Again, I will have the exchange correlation with the original density plus an extra term. And then also in the ionic potential, this will interact with the density at the beginning plus an extra term. And the adults now might have moved. So you have this displacement here. And similarly, you have this displacement here, okay? 
So this is basically a, a, a modified total energy functional. And so far, this is just a standard density functional theory. So what we can, can we do at this stage? So at this point, what we can do is that since we're interested in the formation energy, we can take the difference between this expression and the one I showed in the previous slide. And on top of that, we can also remove the self-interaction by simply eliminating the product of this term with this term, because this is precisely the heart self-interaction that uh, you know, was creating problem in the landau pekar model. I don't want to go into the details, but basically what we do is to also remove the exchange and correlation self-interaction, but this is more like about practicalities. The key point is that the self-interaction of the electron with itself is gone in this formalism. And as you do that, and you expand the displacements to second order, you find a, 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 a simple expression for the formation energy that actually is close to the landau pekar equation. So the energy will be given in this case by the expectation value of the constant Hamiltonian over your uh, uh, extra uh, uh, kind of uh, the wave function of your extra electron. Then there will be a linear interaction term between your electron density, extra electron density, and the uh, uh, atomic displacements. And then there will be a penalty energy that is essentially an elastic energy that has to do with the fact that if you move the atoms uh, away from equilibrium, there will be a restoring force. Here C stands for the matrix of interatomic force constants that we discussed on Monday. And you know this is the standard uh, you know, quadratic uh, uh, energy function for the uh, energy of a uh, harmonic lattice. So this is to say that uh, uh, by just looking at the DFT equations and removing self-interaction, one can reach an expression for the formation energy, which is quite neat. And at this point, we can work with that. So if you have a total energy, uh, what you do in DFT, you try to find the minimum. And the formal way to do that is to perform variational uh, uh, differentiation with respect to the wave function here and with respect to the atomic displacement. The derivative of, the, of this energy function with respect to wave function will give, uh, uh, for example, for the first integral, I derive with respect to this function, and I'm left with Hamiltonian times psi, so in this term. The derivative of this one, again, will give me a wave function times this term, which you see here. And then you have a Lagrange multiplier that comes from normalization. And similarly, one can do derivatives with respect to displacement. You find this second equation. So what basically we find here is a modified Consham equation that now contains an interaction of the extra electron with potential at displacement of the atoms away from the equilibrium, and then a relation that gives us the displacement in terms of the extra uh, the density of this uh, extra electron. So this is now a uh, uh, nonlinear coupled again value problem that can, could give us potentially you know uh, localized object if they exist. Now this expression uh, resolves the problem of uh, uh, the uh, self interaction, but uh, it does not solve the problem of you know potentially needing to perform calculations of very large supercells. Because you know we don't know how large is this polar, and maybe maybe requiring you know ten by ten by ten or twenty by ten by twenty supercells, which may be a little bit too large. So at this point, there is another uh, uh, operation one can do, which actually is very simple. The idea is that uh, I consider that uh, uh, if you perform band structure calculations, your Konsham states form a complete basis for any other wave function in the same uh, kind of in a, you know in your crystal. So I can write down, for example, my a uh, uh, wave function of the extra electron as a linear superposition of block functions. That's always allowed. And then I can do the same for the displacement. I can write any displacement in, the, in, a, in my crystal as a linear combination of normal vibrational modes. So these will be the eigen modes of the, let's say, DFPT dynamical matrix. So clearly, this is just a rewriting on the problem. And what I'm doing is to say, I don't know the wave function displacements uh, on the left. And on the right, what I don't know is the coefficients that we call A and B. Okay. But now the point is that I can replace these two expressions in the equations of the previous slide. And when I do that, I obtain again a coupled nonlinear system of equations. This time, the system depends on basically uh, the unknowns are the coefficients a and b. And the interesting part of these equations is that the only uh, ingredients that you need to solve them is the electron band structure here, the phonon dispersion here, and then the electron phonon matrix elements. So, uh, as you have understood from this school, now it is a, a calculation of band structure and forms are straightforward. Calculations of matrix elements in large grids are now possible, for example, using uh, EPW or other codes. And everything that is needed to solve these equations is available. And so that one can try to solve these equations and see whether there are any uh, localized uh, uh, solutions. And this is basically what you will do in the tutorials uh, with uh, John and Chao later today. 
Now, uh, uh, let me show you what happens if you try to perform these calculations. So first of all, maybe just to mention that once you perform this expansion, uh, if you use a brilliant zone grid, let's say of maybe five by five by five K points, what that really means is that your system uh, 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 basically uh, lives in a, in a periodic supercell that corresponds to five by five by five unit cells, right? So this will be periodic in a five by five by five supercell. Now I can perform solutions, uh, try and look for solution for this supercell. And I don't know if I will find it. If I want a larger supercell, I just increase the number of K points, maybe 10 by 10 by 10, 15, 15, 15, and so on. So this is an example for lithium fluoride, where, uh, which is just a rock salt simple structure where uh, uh, one looks for solutions, starting, for example, for a seven by seven by seven uh, uh, K point grid, which is equivalent to a seven by seven by seven supercell. And uh, here the energy is zero, meaning that the solution is fully delocalized and the extra electron sits on the, at the bottom of the conduction band. So there is no, what we, no such thing as a polar. Then you repeat the operation for eight by eight by eight, and again, no polar, nine, 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 10, 10, 10, and so on, until you hit 12, 12, 12, and you start finding something that is lower than zero, and that's a sign that you might have some localization. After that, you keep going and you see that your energy keeps drifting actually. And the reason why this is happening is that you have a, a, a localized object in a periodic supercell. So this is the same kind of physics as uh, in calculations of diff charge defects. Basically they scale with one over the size of the supercell. So you need to extrapolations at infinity to find the energy of the polar you know, uh, uh, as an isolated object in an infinite crystal. So one could ask, okay, why is this happening? Why I don't find polarons for this cell size? And why do I find polarons here? The reason actually is uh, quite simple. Suppose that you have a crystal and that the size of the polar in your crystal uh, 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 is described by this uh, circle here. Now in this uh, uh, range of with orange dots, we have a, a situation where the supercell actually is smaller than the characteristic size of the polar. So that means that when you have periodic supercell, this polar is overlapping with its replicas. And because of that, it's essentially forming things like bonding and bonding combinations and merging into a continuous delocalized object. So you will not find a localized solution. So you start looking, uh, uh, finding localized solutions when the size of the polar becomes much smaller than the size of the supercell that includes it. Okay, so this is a, a standard thing that you can do. And what this really means is that this. Uh, uh, size of supercell is really indicating the boundary between the uh, metallic phase and the insulating phase. So that's basically the point where the metal to insulator transition is occurring. Okay. So how does the polar in this example look for this uh, kind of, um, um, you know, uh, uh, sizes? So this is the, 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 the shape of the electron polar in lithium fluoride. It's basically an object that spans maybe uh, about 10 or 12 uh, uh, unit cells in, in three directions, and it looks more or less like a sphere. So that's what we will call a large uh, or intermediate um, electron polar. And uh, this is the electron wave function. One can also ask you what happens to the atomic displacements. Well, these are the displacement of fluorine uh, that is negatively charged. So it's moving away from the electron charge. So it looks like a kind of a, kind of a porcupine here. And then uh, if you look at the displacement of the, the uh, lithium instead, they would point inward towards the center of this uh, polar. So that would be for the electron polar, meaning I add a charge to lithium fluoride. What happens if I remove a charge? Well, removing a charge meaning, means looking for the whole polar in the same system. And in this case, practically what I have is that I have a completely uh, a, a localized object, which spans only a couple of unit cells. So you see that for the same system, we have very different scenarios if you add an electron or if you remove an electron, okay? So that's what we call a small polar in this system. And uh, now what is the other information we can get from this kind of um, approaches? First of all, we can plot the coefficients on the, on the, on the band structure. So for example, these uh, circles correspond, are proportional to the size of the, so the modulus square of the A coefficients. And they are telling us that the electron polar is mostly formed by a superposition of states near the bottom of the band. And similarly for the phonons, the B coefficients are telling us that what drives the formation of this object is the longitudinal optical modes at long wavelengths and some longitudinal acoustic modes down here, okay? So that's a way to analyze the structure of the polar using uh, an approach that is very similar to what is used uh, uh, for, um, uh, for excitons and that probably uh, uh, Zheng Lu and, and colleagues will uh, discuss over the next couple of days. 
So the only thing one can obtain from this calculation is uh, what is the formation energy. For example, uh, one can look at the uh, uh, total energy uh, again of when you form the electron polar, and that's about 200 milli electron volt. And uh, the gain of energy when you form a whole polar, and that's about two electron volt. So this is to say that uh, the, the the formation of localized objects can alter the energetics of your electrons or holes in your system quite significantly. So for systems like uh, you know, wide band gap insulators, uh, these objects may be very important, you know, to have a complete description of your electronic structure. So I, I, I will close in the five minutes. I just want to give you one other example to, you know, to show a different system. So this is a, just an illustration of a, a, a electron, sorry, a whole polar in bulk hexa hexagonal boron nitride. So the boron nitride planes here are running perpendicular to the screen, and you just see one kind of side of kind of one row of hexagons just because the, the rendering was very, very uh, 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 expensive. So we just removed the other atoms for visualization. And basically, this is a, uh, a, a, a whole polar. As you can see, even if the system is layered, the whole polar looks more or less like a sphere again. And if you look at cuts of this polar along this line or this line, you find more or less Gaussian line shapes. Okay, that's what is expected also from the you know, simple uh, Landau uh, uh, Pecker model. Also, in this case, one could analyze how this polar come, comes about. Basically, it comes from the top of the valence band. And then uh, there are a few modes that make it possible, in particular, some uh, uh, in plane longitudinal uh, optical modes here, some uh, you know, uh, out of plane longitudinal optical modes here. And then we have some interlayer sliding modes and some longitudinal acoustic modes. Uh, the interesting question is also what, what happens if you go to, to the monolayer. So if you strip all the layers except one, you find again a polaron. Also in this case, you have some kind of Gaussian line shape, but as expected, the polaron is completely localized in a single plane here. And it looks more or less like the pictures of accidents that you might have seen about boronite pipe. In this case, the situation is even simpler than the bulk because we only have two uh, types of modes that uh, uh, cause the formation of the polaron. Since the other two modes I showed you in the previous slide, they have to do with the interlayer vibrations and clearly those don't exist in the case of monolayer because we have a single layer. So we only have the longitudinal optical phonons and some longitudinal acoustic phonons that uh, cause the formation of these polarons. And the other observation maybe I, I, I mentioned that these two polarons are extremely shallow meaning that uh, uh, you probably can only observe them uh, at very low temperature and they are not expected to survive you know, uh, at things like uh, room temperature in these systems. Um, in the last uh, kind of uh, uh, maybe three or four slides, I just want to mention that uh, what I presented in these um, uh, slides is uh, uh, a, let's say, a density function theory version of a more general framework uh, that uh, has to do with the uh, uh, you know, quantum field theory approach that I described on Monday. So on Monday, basically, we discussed the familial self-energy, how to use the Dyson equation to obtain the Green's function of the electron, uh, and then uh, one can go through a loop that involves also the, uh, the, the, the vertex. Now, here, I don't put the, the d by wall self-energy just uh, because uh, it is left out other convenience, but one could also add that. So this is where we were left on Monday. So recently, uh, uh, John Lafuente Bartolomeu is, will be uh, running the tutorial later, has discovered that actually if you want to, uh, if you enable the displacement of atoms away from their equilibrium position, there is another uh, uh, self-energy that appears in the formalism, which um, uh, he has called the polar self-energy. And this has to be incorporated in this formalism in order to obtain um, a, a complete formulation. So uh, I, I will not give details about that, but I just want to mention that uh, following the formalism we discussed on Monday, one can again, uh, write down Green's functions using Dyson orbitals. And this time the Dyson orbitals uh, can be expanded in terms of block waves. So in the formulas I just described, we were expanding the, uh, the polar wave function in terms of block waves. In this upgraded formalism, one expands the Dyson orbital in terms of block waves. And uh, uh, you can also uh, rewrite the equations I gave you uh, uh, for the coefficients by not only using this polar and self energy, which is identical to the equations I showed you earlier, but also incorporated the familial self energy. And this basically gives you a complete um, uh, kind of framework to study polarons from a many body perspective. So the equations that I just described and the pictures of polarons I just showed you, they correspond to the DFT approximation to this many body equation. 
So why these many body equations are useful? Well, because uh, if you study uh, uh, polarance, uh, uh, you, you realize that there is a lot of uh, literature, you know, going back, you know, uh, almost 100 years, where people try to look for um, extremely accurate solutions of model Hamiltonians. In particular, there is some a model which is very famous, which is called the Frölich model. In this model, you have a one electron interacting with one longitudinal optical phone. So the interaction strength is controlled by a dimensionless coupling constant called alpha. And uh, what people look for usually is uh, what is the dependence of the polar formation energy on this um, constant alpha. So just to give you a sense of where we are, uh, standard insulators would have an alpha value around the, you know, two or four, and then ionic insulators may have alpha values close to 15, 20, okay? So this is basically a typical range of values that um, you span in real materials. Now, in this kind of model, there is an essentially exact solution, which comes from diagrammatic Monte Carlo approaches. So these are calculations from the group of Cesare Franchini. So these are a very sophisticated approach where you perform an expansion of Feynman diagrams and uh, use stochastic methods to, to get um, exact solutions. And this is given by the white dots here. And then the closest thing to this approach that, uh, that has ever come to this approach is the uh, uh, formalism developed by Feynman based on the uh, path integral uh, 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 quantum mechanics. So you see that basically Feynman's uh, approach, which is the black line, is extremely close to the exact solution. Now, the interesting bit is that there is no other theoretical approach that has ever come close to these two solutions uh, you know, in the past decades. And I'm just putting this because I want to show that the theory developed by uh, uh, La Fuente Bartolome here is extremely close to this, and it does not involve any uh, kind of uh, diagrammatic Monte Carlo approaches. It just involves the summation of the familial self-energy and the polar and self-energy. So for the experts in the audience, those who have been working maybe on the many body theory of polarons, I just want to uh, explain what is going on. In Monte Carlo, in the Gramati Monte Carlo, what one does is to try to sum all the many body electron form diagrams, including crossing diagrams, up to infinity. And this is done stochastically, okay? So you try to add as many diagrams as, as, as you can. And you try to, to, to select those diagrams that will have the largest weight into your self-energy. In the approach by La Fuente Bartolome, what is happening is that uh, uh, one uses only two diagrams in practice, but in these two diagrams, the green functions are not the green functions. These are the renormalized, full interacted green functions. So if you try to expand these two double lines into, uh, uh, you know, using the Dyson equation, you will find a, a series of diagrams that will probably recover this one. And the, 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 the advantage of this approach is that this is easier to handle from the point of view of our initial calculations. So I will not say more about that because, uh, you know, there is a lot to say, but uh, I guess uh, the, the, the bottom line is that, uh, uh, you know, there is a, a clear connection between the many body theory of electron form interaction as showed you on Monday and the theory of polarons. So this brings me to the, my um, uh, uh, last slide with the take-home messages. Uh, uh, the, the key point is that if you do DFT calculation of polarons, you will meet the self-interaction error, and that will make the calculations uh, 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 unreliable. So uh, the other thing is that there are many types of polarons here at the bottom. Uh, there are polarons that are look like uh, atomic orbitals, and polarons that look like uh, objects that uh, are spanning, you know, several nanometers. Uh, uh, so you know what we believe now is that the formation of polarons is ubiquitous in materials. We have not proven that. But actually, we have reason to believe that polarons are a little bit everywhere. Uh, the other two things is that uh, there is a technique that we will test in the tutorials to uh, calculate these polarons, uh, even from small to large. And the last point is that the, um, uh, the DFT uh, uh, approach to, kind of to polarons using this uh, couple linear system of equations is a approximation to a, a broader uh, kind of theoretical framework that connects uh, to the many body theory that we discussed on Monday. So we start uh, having a better understanding of all these features and how they connect uh, you know, across the board. And finally, uh, this is the usual uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, slide with references. So I will let you, uh, you know, go through the hyper hyperlinks on the PDF that is uploaded online. And I just want to mention that the two theories that are described here, uh, the one of the ab initio polar equations and the many body approach are reported basically in these two papers. And with that, I think I will stop here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Felicia. That was very, very clear, very nice talk. Uh, I think we have the time for a few questions, maybe for four or five minutes. So do you want to go through them and then yeah. at some point stop? 
Uh, yeah, okay, let me start. So what is a basic way to think of polarons? Some quasi particle that is treated as electron plus phone is, is currently how I think about it. Well, I, I guess, um, yeah, I guess you asked this question at the beginning of the lecture. I hope that it became clear through the lecture that the way we think of polarons now is that you have a localized object and that would be the quasi particle. And then on top of that, you might have also the satellites, the phone satellites that people find in ARPES. These will be the shake up excitations, okay? So that's basically the way we, we would imagine them. Uh, then in page 15, I didn't understand well the relation between the formation energy and size of the materials. If you can explain, it would be thankful. So in page 15, formation energy and size of the materials. Uh, I guess, uh, 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 so, okay, so what uh, I, I meant here is that the, so if the polaron, so suppose this is the supercell that you're looking at, if the intrinsic polar in this material is smaller than this size, then you can do a calculation and capture this polaron. Uh, if the polaron size was as large as the supercell, if you try this calculation, it will not localize simply because the polaron overlaps with its replicas and then it delocalizes as a result of that. So just a matter of um, you know, playing with the size of the polaron versus the size of the supercell. So one should be smaller than the other, otherwise there cannot be any localization. Then from Tom, are you sure about the minus sign from the Bordeaux term on slide 18? I need to go and it in. Uh, yes, I'm sure about the minus sign. Uh, I thought epsilon zero, so the term between brackets is negative. Uh, yeah, it could be that these two terms have been swapped. Okay, so this minus sign certainly is going to be there. It could be that the epsilon infinity should be in front of the epsilon naught. So this number should be uh, positive. So maybe you're right, there is a typo. Okay. Then slide 21. I don't quite understand. I don't quite understand why it is justified to eliminate the self energy term, the self energy term, and the Hartree terms. It, is, it basically this is a problem of DFT. It should not be there to start with. Okay, so when we do DFT calculations, uh, we add the charge of each electron to the uh, to the heart. It's basically, so the, the the square mass of the wave function contributes to the charge density. Uh, then the charge density gives the Hartree potential. Therefore, then then the Hartree potential interacts with the electron itself. So the electron is interacting with the potentiality itself generated. So this should not be there. So that's actually what is called, removing that is what is called self-interaction correction. So if you want, you can go back to the paper by Zanger where the, the self-interaction concept was described in the, in the 90s, okay? Then in page 21, there is, whoop, present an extra term psi in the kinetic energy. Uh, so the, the extra term here comes from the fact that if, suppose this is the valence electrons, okay? And then I add one electron to the system, well, there will be a wave function describing this electron. So this is the kinetic energy of that of that, of that uh, uh, electron. Uh, so now I'm having a bit of a conceptual problem of calling polaron localized. In particular, as understood from the presentation, the electron interaction, localize an electron hole around some lattice site. However, due to the translation in the lattice, this could have also happened at some other sites. And those two polar sites should be the general. Uh, yeah, I, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, and it's a very delicate question, actually. So um, the what, what so if you want to be precise, what I described in these slides is what we call the pinned polar. So it's a polar held around a lattice site. Okay, indeed, as you as you as you point out, if I perform a calculation trying to initialize the localized solution somewhere else, the polaron will sit there. So that means that there is an infinite degeneracy of energies of polaron sitting at different lattice sites, right? So this results from the fact uh, that in DFT the atoms are classical objects, okay, and therefore you cannot have translational invariance of the complete many-body Hamiltonian. So this is something that is uh, uh, quite delicate. So if you are interested in that, um, actually we have a uh, discussion. So in this paper, uh, sorry. 
So in this paper here, this uh, PRB paper, if you go to the last section, we discuss exactly the point that you're asking. Um, I think it would be maybe in the test of time, uh, uh, we could maybe move on and, and maybe you can reply by, by typing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fine. That's okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.